Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 44 of My POA Podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. Sorry we're running a little bit late tonight live, but if you watch this after the lives, I guess it don't really matter. Uh, but I want to thank everybody that got me on here tonight, Shane Jackson, my producer, and the general manager here at Jackson's Auto Family. We're coming to you live from Studio B in Enid, Oklahoma. So uh, keep that in mind if you're ever looking for a Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram, uh, Chevy, General, GMC, or, of course, Buick. So we also have two lots full of nice pre-owned cars. So our main sponsor this evening is Bruns Performance Horses from Iowa. We're going to be talking about uh, that up-and-coming program. It's one of the, the hot programs this year for sure. Sammy Bruns is doing a great job uh, for her clients and for her own POAs, and I think it's just the tip of the iceberg for her career in POAs. Of course, she's a heritage a member, I call it, and her mom was too. Her mom grew up in POAs uh, up in Minnesota, as she did also, Sammy. So we'll be talking about her program in the middle of the show. Thank you for the sponsorship. As always, we have two sponsorships available, like the one Bruns has tonight. And then uh, there's two of those available each night. And then the, that's called the Supreme sponsorship. And then there's an ROM sponsorship, which is... Uh, a lot less money that's only twenty dollars and that's like one picture and a birthday wish or a thank you or supreme champion almost like a page in the old magazines it's just like that i'll just say whatever you know one or two lines in the picture but a su supreme uh sponsorship like tonight is uh fifty dollars and it's uh, five pictures and a splurge in the middle there uh, and the segment in the middle and then of course several mentions and then all the advertising uh, you get during the week so I hope uh, people are coming on live here. I'm not sure if I can tell tonight. Uh, I don't know if I have the screen up or not, but tonight we have episode 44, which is the hardship clause. And I was gonna do this spring, do this this spring, and then I ran into a few complications and we ended up doing it now. Uh, but I think it's gonna be a good episode. Now, when we talk about hardships, we have two types of hardships in the POA breed. We have the Appaloosa horse that can be hardshipped as a POA if it meets the requirements. Of course, height is the main one, color is usually there, uh, but POAs over the years had a little different rules than the apps. They're starting to line up more now, uh, but over the years, of course, the height was 54. Uh, that's when some were hardshipped in. There wasn't many Appaloosas hardshipped, if any, before the 54 limit, of course, in the 50s and early 60s. And then when it went to 14 hands in uh, 1986, it was uh, a lot more horses were eligible to come in because 14 hands. So there's quite a few, even quarter horses, that's, of course, not eligible. But there's stock horses that are around that mark. And uh, if it's an Appaloosa, it can become a POA. Then the other type of hardship, of course, we call it like your old pony or your little pony that's spotted. It might have came from a POA program. Maybe it was just a cross, like a pony to a horse and, or an Appaloosa to something. It might have been a grade POA that lost its way, a registered POA that even lost its papers or its way, and it ends up renamed in a hardship. And we're going to tell some cool stories about those. Of course, we can't mention every hardship. I was trying to figure out how many hardships there's been, and I didn't take out the stud books. But, you know, there's over 50,000 registered POAs. Every year, the front so many pages of the stud book, every two years when they print one, uh, is hardships. So, you know, I would, what would you venture to guess? Probably three to 5,000 hardship POAs, somewhere in that area, I think. Uh, I bet it's around that many. So I'm going to make a phone call real quick and make sure I'm live here. So bear with me, please. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Can you hear, are you watching it on Facebook? No, I can't. Okay, you're live, honey, maybe. So, okay, I just don't know if we're live. So, could you go on there and then text me? Right, okay, that's why I didn't want you to say anything. So, you're talking to the Pentagon. Okay, everybody, sorry for that. Maybe we can edit that in post-production. We don't do that. Thanks. 
honey. I, I don't have a bar up tonight, honey, a, th a conversation thing, so I can't see any conversations. So what I may do is go on Facebook on my phone since we don't have any guests tonight and get it that way. So because I'm kind of running blind, I know people want to make comments and stuff, and I can't see it. So there we go. Four comments already. Okay. Terry says hi. Lisa says hi. All right. Let's reboot this thing. Thanks, Monica. All right, everybody, sorry for that. I just couldn't see it. This way it'll actually be better because now I can see your names, like Susie Crane Hampton, who's we're gonna talk about a stay-in from their program and a mayor actually tonight a little bit. Uh, Dave's gonna be one of the um, upcoming episodes. So I should talk about that real quick, some of the upcoming episodes we have. Uh, next week we're off because I'm gonna take two weeks to uh, study up on Doc Demers and his program. I know it like the back of my hand, but because of that, I want to make sure I do it right, and that's a good show. That's episode 45. That'll be the 18th, and then episode 46 is the art of the POA. That's going to be a fun episode. I'm going to kind of keep it a little secret what it's about. You can kind of guess. That's on the 25th of October, and then uh, Dave Morris and the 2Ds program is going to be the episode on November 1st. And then we have a couple uh, big farms to talk about. 48 and 49 is going to be Lammers and Lannons, both Nebraska programs. Them are going to be big shows worth watching. Again, those will be in uh, November. And then if you heard or not, if you've seen on POAs, my wife and I, Monica, are going to go to Pennsylvania. That's where Monica lived for 15 years, and her mom moved back there. Her mom originally was from that area, Redding, and she's been back there about six, seven years or so now. So we go back for Thanksgiving every once in a while. This year we plan on doing that. So, of course, I said, hey, let's do something uh, POA-wise. And uh, so we're going to do a podcast live from Reading, Pennsylvania on November 22nd. I know it's Thanksgiving week. Some people might have a hard time getting there. But that was a, a hotbed of POA activity back in the day. Of course, Danny Boy and John, uh, John was back there and uh, way back when in the 60s and, of course, the 70s. John Ludwig, Lazy A Ranch, was uh, in Moulton, just out Mountain, just outside of Reading. And there's been lots of POA people in near the Reading area, just like, you know, Edmond, Oklahoma, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, different towns over the years, Decatur, Illinois, well, the Reading area. And then, of course, Maryland's close, and there's quite a few areas that are pretty close there. So if you can come to it, I'm calling it a meetup like Reunion, uh, Schuylkill Valley, uh, Northeast area. Uh, so it's on your own, but Monica and I will set up the place to have a little, uh, probably about 2 o'clock on Tuesday, November 22nd. So if you can come, just look up on Facebook and RSVP. Again, it's on your own if you want to eat a, a late lunch or early dinner, but then we're going to share pictures. I'm going to go live, share stories and pictures, and hopefully we bring a bunch of POA people together from that area from different generations. Some of them might not even know each other, but they might have grew up 100 miles apart or less. So I think that's going to be a cool show. And then, of course, we have a big show on December 6th will be the Mike Gardner family, Rock and Y from Utah. I'm uh, proud and nervous to do that episode, too. I have a lot of respect for the Gardner family. Of course, they're one of the top programs going uh, right now, and uh, they've brought a lot of great POAs, and I just enjoy talking to Mike and the Gardner family. So that'll be a cool episode. That's episode 51 in the first week of December there. Ken Wells Ranch will be episode 52 on December 13th. And then we wrap up the year with uh, the, two th the 2023 Stallion roster. Last year was one of our most popular shows. This is a sponsored show. If you want your Stallion included in it, it's $50 a Stallion. Last year we had 20 or so Stallions. That's where I cut it off about because to do justice and not run the show three, four hours, uh, that's what we got to do. So, again, that's a sponsored show on 1220 right before Christmas. I'll probably wear a hat. It's too hot in the studio to wear a full-blown suit, or I'd probably do that uh, Santa suit. So, uh, again, that'll be episode 53, and that'll round out our year. So let's get back to this hardship story, the hardship clause, as I'm calling this episode. And this is Richland's Pole Kitty. 
Richland's pole kitty was technically not really hardship, but we're going to tell a story about her and start out with her and uh, how she got in it. And before I get into her bloodlines and stuff, I just kind of want to mention, you know, all breeds, especially the stock breeds, had to rely on something to to build them. You know, three bars, of course, we all know that. If you're into pedigrees, three bars built the quarter horse. And then because of that, the other stock breeds, even POAs, uh, was helped significantly because of a little thoroughbred named Three Bars. And like one of my favorite Appaloosas growing up was Roman Strawman. Well, Roman Strawman is a lot of thoroughbred and a lot of quarter horse. So, you know, if he didn't, if that blood wasn't allowed in the apps, look at what he did uh, with all his uh, progeny. Hayes Roman Cloud is his sire, and of course he's sired by a thoroughbred and out of an Appaloosa. And then Roman Strawman's mother was a quarter horse, but she was an appendix quarter horse. She was out of a quarter horse mare and sired by the well-known thoroughbred Jack Straw. So, you know, Roman Strawman's both grandsires were thoroughbreds and he became a famous Appaloosa sire. So that's kind of a cool story there. And that's, we're gonna see that theme throughout POAs, how horse blood and the hardship clause uh, help POAs. And then of course the other side of the hardship, the little, little pony uh, or the pony that lost us way, it's gonna be part of this episode too. So getting back to our first one we're gonna talk about, this is Richland's Pole Kitty. And I gotta look down at my comments. A lot of people are watching tonight. Hi, Dean, Lisa, Heather, Emily's watching, uh, Sandy, Dean's watching twice. <laughs> David Wood, if I missed you, I'm sorry. Terry's watching, Terry's from Reading. We're gonna see her at our uh, meetup reunion out there in November. So Richland's Pole Kitty, was born in 1969 and of course she spent a long life with the Carr family, Gene Carr, and became one of the foundations of his program. Uh, but before that she was bred and raised by one of Gene's really good friends, Dr. John Edinburgh. Dr. John Edinburgh was uh, a director, early director in the POAs. He raised the Richlands POAs and then sometimes he just put the R with prefixes. Uh, or my mean, uh, you know, things around him, in uh, air quotes. Anyway, um, one of his early day homebred champions and way ahead of her time was Richland's Pole Kitty. Now, she's a yearling in this picture and she's up on a ledge and stuff. I know she looks a little out of whack, but believe me, she's a nice POA in that picture. That would have been uh, in 1970. And I just want to read a story that a cover story. This picture appeared on the ma in the magazine, I believe probably February or March of 72, and uh, she was shown uh, in 71 as a two-year-old. She was shown 25 times, 23 of those times she was uh, first place. Two of them, once she got beat, and then two of the times she couldn't show in the two-year-old mares, the show when the state or whatever had a class that didn't have just two-year-olds, it was two and up. So, but in her class, she was almost undefeated. She went to nine states, and of course she won the International in Hutchison, Kansas that year, the 13th International. I believe I got a picture of that. And uh, anyway, so the cool story about her, there, there's the picture of her winning in Hutchison, Kansas right there, a little grainy. But if you look at that long neck, and just her long body, she was a short mare. She stayed short, but you could tell her breeding, she had a lot of horse breeding. And this is what Dr. John Edinburgh wrote about her in 1972. I'll just show me why I'm reading here. Apologize me looking down. The ironic thing about this mare is that if she were born today, she would not be registered. Her dam is an excellent grade mare that has thrown color with four different Appaloosa and POA stallions out of the four matings. Her sire is Tips Polecat, APHC. With a hardship clause, this mating could be repeated, hoping that another individual like her would be the result. And then it's funny, right in this cover story, it says, Editor's Note, a hardship clause was passed at the March 10 directors meeting. So it is now possible that POAs of this quality can once again be registered. 
So that was probably the board of director meeting like we have in the spring still, the POA club does, like at the convention. Uh, they probably had one back then in March, and that was around March 10th of 1972. They voted in the hardship clause again, so POAs like that could be registered. They wouldn't have to have two registered parents. Of course, for a long time, you still could have just one registered parent. Uh, Richland's pole kitty, her sire, like we said, was Tip's pole cat. He was an own grandson of Leo. So way back then in 1969, when she was foaled, she was sired by an Appaloosa son of Leo. He was a snow cap, of course, Tip's pole cat. And then the bottom was a lot of Richland's, uh, and they were kind of Welsh, Shetland pony crosses, really good, well-bred ponies, but not POAs. And uh, not some of them weren't registered, some of them were. And back then, they were starting to put so much horse in it, they didn't really always put the registration numbers of the Shetlands or the Welsh. So, But that's how you get the combination of the cool-looking Richlands pole kitty. Of course, she won a lot for the Edinburgh family. Then the Lewises, who we did an episode about, took her as a young mare and trained on her and did some stuff with her. And then she was purchased, I believe, in 75 or 6 by Gene Carr, and his kids all rode her. And uh, then she became one of his brood mares. Of course, Santee Carbine is one of her foals, and Santee Pistol is one of her foals, both by Twister, Santee Twister. Of course, Pistol went out to uh, LVO, to uh, Cliff and Joanne Thomas. And then before that, Carbine, he stayed at Gene Carr's and became one of his herd sires. He was a small bay with a loud blanket. And when she was bred to Tough Plotted, of course, she had Santee Foxy Lady, Santee Prince Leo, who became a Supreme Champion, and then TAF Doc Holliday, whose name was changed. His name was Santee Foxer, but when he went out to Oregon, uh, a dentist and it had Toothacre Farm, so they named him TAF, his prefix, Doc Holliday. Uh, but he was a Santee out of this mare, actually, and he did a good job as a Northwestern sire out there. So... That's the story of Richland's pole kitty and how this hardship clause kind of got going. Of course, rules were meant to be broken, and people always push the envelopes when you're competing, and that happened with the hardship clause. People started registering horse babies and a lot of yearlings. There was yearlings that I can show went through the sale, and even a weanling that was a full-blooded horse that went through the sale uh, because it was under the height limit of a weanling. So they allowed, well... Pretty quick, people realize, uh-oh, that's not going to work because these weanling and yearlings could go over 54 inches. So they come up, I don't know what year. If I had Dave Morris on here, he probably could get it out of his uh, all his meetings that he keeps, uh, minutes, meeting minutes. But they changed the rule that you had to be a two-year-old to be hardship. So that's still in effect today, I believe. You have to be at least two years old to be hardshipped. And that was kind of from that rule that you could just register a horse as a baby or a yearling, and that wouldn't be fair, of course, if they went over height. All right, moving on. There's Richland's pole kitty. So our next famous hardship we're going to talk about, and we're not going to talk about him as much as he deserves to be talked about because episode 10 was all about this horse, and this is East Acres Double Tough. And, of course, this picture was taken in 1980. He would have been... Uh, 10 years old in this picture and he was the four-time grand champion stallion two weeks from now we're going to be talking about him again and a lot of his docks foals because he was purchased by the julian nemers family in 75 right after his first international win uh, some of docks kids rode him and then of course he became uh, the premier sire of the time uh, especially uh, back then and the thing we're going to see throughout the night He's the first one we're going to see this way, and then we're going to go on. Look at the long neck and the long body. Well, that's because his dad was a horse. His mother was about a 54-inch grade mare. Uh, Doc actually went to Kansas where he was foaled years and years later and seen his sire and dam and met the people that created Double Tough. Of course, Max Nebergall named him East Acres Double Tough and had him hardship inspected uh, in Tipton, Iowa. Uh, way back in probably 74 that would have happened so again we could talk all night about double tough but i just wanted people to know he was a hardship a true hardship his dad was an appaloosa and his mother was a pony they were mated and out came a a pony app cross that stayed 54 inches and under and there he is 
Rated Royal was an example of a registered Appaloosa that became a POA and then did well, uh, especially in Halter. He was the 1987 and 1989 International Show Grand Champion, which is now the Congress Show. And Ruth Pecoy is the person that hardshipped him. His sire is Royal Exhibit. Royal Exhibit, when I was a little kid, was a famous Appaloosa, uh, Kevin Jewell. It was a famous story of how he won a show and he had taught the stallion how to bow and he bowed well. He was bred to a small quarter mare and uh, the result was rated royal. That small quarter mare's name was Kate Judy. She was a Skipper Row daughter who's by Skip Barrett, that's Wee's Camp, and then of course Spotted Rose by Spot Cash, that's Wee's Camp breeding as well. So, and then Royal Exhibit was a son of the executive who was a big name in the 70s in the Appaloosas. And then Royal Exhibit was a very pretty stallion. And so POAs was lucky to have an own son of Royal Exhibit as a registered POA. And uh, he never did go on to be that great a sire. I mean, he sired a few that showed. And uh, there was a Doc's rated R that I believe Ruth Pecoy bred, but Doc bought the mare, put his prefix on him. But his claim to fame is that he won Grand Champion Stallion twice. Uh, the Leon Chastain family, this is Leon's... Leon's daughter, uh, they owned the stallion when he won. They'd purchased him from Ruth Picoy. Uh, many people will remember Leon. He was the editor of the magazine for years because they lived not too far from Indianapolis. And around, what, probably 99 or 2000, he became the editor and ran the magazine for several years and did a good job. So if I had a profile picture of Rated Royal, again, you'd see the length of his body and his hip and stuff just compared to a P regular POA because this horse has no pony blood in him. Another famous Appaloosa stallion that became a two-time grand champion is Mr. Respect. And here he is with, uh, I believe that's Seth Thomas. There's two Som Thomas boys. Hopefully I didn't uh, screw up his name. Uh, of course, Joanne and, uh, or Joan and Cliff Thomas from California. Cliff was a longtime POA president of the board. And they came out in 1995 with this two-year-old Appaloosa colt and one grand with him. As I mentioned before, that's the earliest you can hardship now, and it was back in 95. And then this was a repeat in Tulsa. They won in Gordyville, Illinois in 95, and then in 96 they won again with him. Uh, so two times in a row. And look at the bulk on this horse and stuff. And, and of course, he became a Hall of Fame sire and a Hall of Fame because of his show career, too, but mainly because of his babies. Uh, the Thomas family is still doing well with their LVO prefix. LVO's uh, respects Poco Bien is one of his sons, and he's a few spot. He's done a great job. I think he's about towards the end of his career now. Uh, but, uh, of course, Mr. Respect, as I said, is in the Hall of Fame because of his contribution to the POA, and he wouldn't have been a POA without the hardship clause. This is his sire. Mr. Ree, he was an at registered Appaloosa. That's Steve Del Porto. That's the California connection there with uh, Thomas's in California and the Del Porto Ranch in California. So he was a model looking Appaloosa in the mid 80s. They, he was advertised a lot. He was a national and world champion stallion. So I would have more pictures of Mr. Respects Foles, but eventually I'm gonna do an LVO. Um, episode of course they deserve one so we'll have one and then we'll have all kinds of mr respect foals on that episode all right we got a lot of people watching tonight that's great thank you for tuning in we're doing the hardship clause episode 44 so here's another appaloosa that was a registered appaloosa this is a mare ha's top request is her poa name uh she came in and wiped out the POA mare. She won three years in a row. They purchased her in 1987, and they couldn't show her in 87, I believe, because they had to wait till she caught up the, you know, the height restrictions for each age. But she was for sure under 14 hands. And the Hendricks family found her, Roger Hendricks in Cannon Falls at a sale. And uh, Barb was, was Roger's wife, and this is Nancy, their daughter. She's a teenager in this picture, and she showed her all three years, uh, 88, 89, and 90. She set the record, the only mare to win grand champion three times. Of course, that mare was, record was just tied uh, by the JBJ's mare. Uh, so that was the big deal this year. If she would have won, which she went reserve, 
uh, she would have took uh, the record away from this mare. But as it stands, they are tied. Uh, but this mare was a hardship. And I'm going to show you again. Look at the length of this mare. Just a long neck. There was nothing in the pin with that neck when she was showing in the late 80s and the early 90s. Long croup. Yeah, she's long in the back and long legs and everything. But she was a 56-inch uh, POA. I actually got the judges mare when I was in uh, FFA judging. I started a judging team in Kimball, Minnesota at my high school when I was a sophomore. And I went to one of the state contests, I think my junior year. And she was there. And they didn't put her in the POA class. They put her in the Appaloosa class. And I put her first out of the four Appaloosas. And so did the judge. The judge that we were going off of uh, put her first. And she would have wiped out the four little POAs that were there that day. in uh, I think it was in St. James, Minnesota. But this is HA's top request. Again, three-time grand champion. Uh, she produced the supreme champion. And... Uh, Again, she wouldn't be a POA without the hardship. Okay, so you kind of see the theme. We're talking about the, the Appaloosas first, pretty much. We're going to throw a couple around at the end but uh, and mix it up because the end's going to be a lot of... We've got about 20 to talk about tonight, and a lot of them are going to be uh, ponies, too, that are not full-blood Appaloosas. But this mare right here, TC Touch of Tardy, was bred to be an Appaloosa, and she's by Tardy and Impressive. So again, it was pretty great that in the, that time period, POAs were able to have an own daughter of Tardy and Impressive. That's pretty cool in the POAs, not just breeding to one that's a horse or whatever, she was actually a registered POA. So I'm gonna get her pedigree out here as we look at a little different shot of her. There's Tardy and Impressive. You can see that beautiful head. He was a famous, famous, Court horse, of course, and he did sire some Appaloosas, probably some paints, a lot of great quarter horses. So here's a better picture of Tracy. Of course, TC is Tracy's prefix and her family's prefix before that. Again, look at that neck, the head too, just the ear set and everything, the shoulder slope, the croup, but the necks on these little horses, they don't have any pony blood to influence, to stub up the neck. So that's one of the big advantages these hardship horses have coming into our still pony breed, even though they look like horses, the POAC, uh, they're pure horse. So of course she's tardy impressive as her sire, and own, son of impressive, and then her dam was an Appaloosa named Flips Plotted by Bar Plotted. I had a picture of him. He's a King Plotted son by Red Plotted. So some Wees Camp Appaloosas uh, there. This mare had a pretty good show career, of course. Uh, Tracy was fairly young back then if she's on here tonight, which unfortunately she might not be because of the storm and stuff. Uh, but she could tell you more about, uh, you know, where she was at in her life when this mare came into her life. If, if she got this mare now, it'd probably be even a more impact, different story, uh, because she's at a way different part, place in her POA career and just in her life. Uh, but she was a good looking mare. She won a lot of blue ribbons. That's at the Shelbyville. Uh, Southeast Regional, I believe. And then she became a pretty good broodmare. This is one of her uh, fillies. This is Too Blonde to Speak. And Too Blonde to Speak became the mother of Hollywood Bombshell, who is here. Aston's uh, showed her this year. Look at the, a lot of checks and placings there. She did well at the Futurity. Uh, of course, tribute to Hollywood. Bred the Palomino mare we just saw, who was an own daughter of TC Touch of Tardy, to get this two year old who's really rocking it out the four white socks and the buckskin color. And uh, she's got a promising career ahead of her, already winning uh, quite a bit just as a two year old. Again, that's Aston's right there. They're the breeders of her. And they had two, uh, two blonde to speak, of course, too. So here's another granddaughter of. Touch of Tardy, great granddaughter actually, because Tracy's good few spot mare that she got from Jackie Blazer, uh, the JBJ's mare that's having a lot of these good Weedo Colts and Phillies. She is a granddaughter of TC Touch of Tardy. So I believe Tardy Rose was her mother. So uh, JBJ's a Touch Lucky, I think is her name. She's produced two Futurity winners already. 
uh, Select Sire for charity winners, and then this one here, the Super Pony Award with Lindsey uh, Peter um, Peaton. Sorry about that, Lindsey. She was a guest on the show early on on our episodes. Uh, but anyway, it looks like she did well at the Fachiri this year, winning the Super Pony and a lot of stuff. And then, of course, here's another one from that cross from uh, Tracy's Weedo Stallion. This is TC Forever, a Weedo, and that's out of that JBJ's mare again. And uh, Tracy's producing some beautiful babies. And Full Circle, we're going to talk about that. That's going to be a theme tonight, too. Come Full Circle. Uh, a lot of her success right now can be traced back to that TC Touch of Tardy hardship mare. All right, now we're moving on to a little different part of the hardships, and this is what I alluded to earlier. This guy here is Melvin, and he was a hardship pony that would just be unknown, unknown. Possibly he was bred to be a POA. Maybe he had a Appaloosa parent, one of them, and then a pony parent like Black Hand did. Uh, who knows? Somebody probably knew, <laughs> but he was hard shipped in, uh, and that little girl sitting against the tree there, I love this picture by the way, is in the 80s, Janelle McDowell from Iowa. Of course, we talked to her last week. And the people, if you've been in POAs the last couple years, 10 at least, you know her as Janelle Burton. So, and Janelle and Pat Burton are uh, with their two mares, two or three mares, are rocking it in POAs right now, winning the Futurity and producing good youth uh, and family ponies for people. But Janelle, when she started, her family got started in Iowa with this hardship pony named Melvin. And he was a gamer. I remember uh, reading about him in the magazine. I might have seen him in person at an international. I wasn't at this international in Ohio. I was at the next one. But uh, Janelle won quite a few national titles on him. And then I believe her brother rode him too. And uh, as you can see in this profile picture, and he had a lot of speed, you know, possibly he was bred to be a POA, but we just don't know. But he was registered as Melvin and uh, helped look at the, the story. It's come full circle again because Janelle's still in POAs, and there she is with her young son on the right of this horse. And guess what this POA is? He's a hardship. Al Capone, a lot of people know him. Uh, Burtons have him. He's a little smaller than Melvin, but... Uh, He's a cute little pony, and again, he was probably bred to be a POA. He's so short, and he's got all the characteristics and that old pony mark on his nose, and uh, who knows who he was supposed to be or if he was ever somebody else. Someday we might have chips or tattoos or brands or something, and maybe we'll never do that in POAs. You know, at the flip a coin might be good, might not be good, but... Uh, we could track them. Of course, you get into some extra expense on the owner and the breeder when you do stuff like that and the POA C as well. So this is a cool picture. A lot of great POA people in this picture, of course. Uh, Janelle's parents and then Pat's over there and uh, Rosalind and her daughter, one of her daughters there. So uh, Declan, he gets a crew and he gets his picture taken. He wants all his, uh, his posse there, so his entourage. So maybe he'll watch this show someday and laugh when he sees hears me say that. So, again, there's Janelle. She was the little girl leaning against the tree with the hardship POA Melvin. And here she is as a mature woman with her son and husband and another hardship POA. And it's kind of ironic because Pat and Janelle's bred for a lot of well-bred, registered, pedigreed POAs. Uh, but they also see uh, the benefit of finding a little pony like Al Capone. Terry said Doug Sorrell called those unknown unknown pedigrees line breeding. That's right, line breeding. And I used to say Yukonon when I was reading pedigrees, some Yukonon bloodline. So uh, out of South Dakota by trailer, I heard Doc Nemmer say that one before and Carl Oz, them are all other sayings about uh, ponies or horses that just lost their way. So... All right, we move on to, now this mare was also in Appaloosa, and this is gonna be a, one of those full circle stories as well. And this is I'm Shameless. She became a famous POA mare with the Demerjon family in Illinois, and she helped them get started in POAs. 
But she started out in life in Iowa as a registered Appaloosa. I'm looking at a copy of her Appaloosa Horse Club registration. And it was Jada's Appeal was her name. She was bred by Mark Jundal of uh, Iowa. And Rico Tib or Tubbs was her sire an Appaloosa horse, and I remember seeing his name every year in my leading sires list because she won a halter class one year, and uh, so his name will always be in there as the sire of that. And then her mother was Jada's Last Chance by the stallion Jada. I think I'm saying that right, J-A-D-A. Uh, those were uh, also Appaloosas. So when she was uh, registered in POAs, of course she was registered as I'm... Um, Shameless, a.k.a. I'm, a, I'm just going to read you a little bit with what Ann Demerjan sent to me, if you bear with me while I read this. Dave just said, hi, Kent Rourke. Hi, Dave. Get ready. You're going to be in the spotlight here in uh, November. So we're going to talk a little bit about your program tonight, but just a little bit. In a month, we're going to talk a lot about it. So Denny, Denny Brown said, unknown, number one producer and sire. That's right. So here we go on this mare, and I'm just going to flip some pictures. But this, she, again, you can see the body this Mary, mare carried, carried. And back then you could tell she uh, was a horse, you know, in a POA package. So there's the Demerjan family, and with her two kids. And uh, this is what she wrote. Ima was part of our family for most of her 31 years of life. She was hardshipped into the POA breed. We purchased her from Sarah Franklin Tupper, of course, Sarah Tupp. Franklin grew up in Illinois in POAs. I'm going to add my little stuff in here. Uh, in 2001, for our oldest son, Thomas. Sarah purchased her from the Moser family, who I am told purchased her from Lowell Roseland of Iowa. Lowell rescued Ima from a kill pen. This is interesting because our paths cross in the future. Ima was a JP FC pony for Sarah Tupper. After Ima had aged out, of the junior pony division, you got to remember back then it wasn't all adult, it wasn't adult riding like it is now. Uh, you aged the horse aged out. So uh, after I'm aged out of the junior pony division, Sarah's daughter Jessica took the reins and won many prizes until we purchased her in 2001. I'm and Thomas were a good team for many years. I'm gave us many good memories. After her show career was cut short due to navicular disease, she became a mother. We decided to breed her to the Sudden Impulse, APHC. I remember when they did that because Ann called me. She was looking uh, at Kiddo Tough, and she was looking at some other things, and then eventually they bred to the Sudden Impulse. Um, the stallion was owned by Orlin Stoley, who was a good friend of Lowell Roseland. I believe they owned him together. I might be wrong. I know at one time early on uh, they owned him together. When I seen him in Iowa, uh, they were a partnership. But anyway, that's the full circle part because it was at this point that Lowell was reintroduced to Ima. I regret only breeding her one time. The one time turned out to be special. Ima had Ima Shameless Impulse, a.k.a. Jackson. And there's Jackson right there. A beautiful sorrel colt with a blanket. Jackson went on to win many Futurities, world and national titles. He is still winning today. Ima touched many people. She was the go-to when a cousin or friend came to barn to the barn and ride. So that's always a cool thing when you have that. Everybody's got that one uh, POA that you can put the, you know, they call it the husband horse nowadays, I guess. But I remember back in the day before I stopped riding, when I was like eight or nine, uh, friends would come over and dad would always pick the gentlest broodmare to throw them on uh, so to make sure they were okay because we usually didn't have a gilding at the place. Uh, so... I'm Shameless was, was one of those. Here I have her registration papers right now. Uh, she was bred by Mark Jondahl, like I said before, from Latimer, Iowa. She was owned at the time of registration by the Moser Stock Farm. Of course, 7M's POAs, Bob uh, Moser and all the kids they had in POAs, Bobby and all the other kids and uh, Ladies Warrior. This was years later after that uh, that they got this mare because she was... Uh, actually fold in, uh, let's see, she was registered in 96, it looks like, as a PO, advanced to permanent. So 93, she was registered as a POA. There we go. So, all right. And she was 56 and an eighth 
uh, with shoes. So she was right up there, leopard mare. But again, the hardship saved her, most definitely saved her. Lil Roslin uh, basically raised kids in the POAs way back in the 70s and then came back later in his life to become a pretty good POA breeder. And if he wouldn't have discovered this mare, who knows what would have happened to her. So, And I know this gilding went on to be really famous. If people are watching tonight, you can comment on I'm a Shameless Impulse and some of the, I believe he roaned out, but uh, really nice POA there. Of course, that's Tom Wamsley and, and Kenneth there uh, with Ann in between them. And then on the other side is the two gentlemen we were talking about, uh, Olin Stoley and Lowell Roseland, both from Iowa, Appaloosa, and POA breeders. And Lowell raised his kids in the POAs in the 70s. So I'm shameless. And this is a picture here. Good lead line picture. Real pretty mare. Had a good life. Janelle's watching. I hope you were watching just a minute ago, Janelle, while I was talking about you and your family. All right, so we're about in the middle of our show. I'm going to leave this picture up on the screen for a minute because this is our sponsor tonight. But actually, I'm just sneaking a drink of water. I want to thank everybody for watching tonight. Thanks, Shane Jackson, for getting me on the air tonight. And our sponsor is Bruns Performance Sources of Joyce, Iowa. That's just northeast of Mason City, Clear Lake area, and guess what started there? The POA breed did, the birth of the POAs. Uh, so Sammy's program is right near where all this started in 1954. Uh, as I said before, she's one of the hot trainers going right now. She's still a young lady. She just had uh, her first son, Stetson, first baby, her and her husband, Josh. There they are on cue right there. Look at that young family. Of course, Sammy was born into POAs. Her grandma raised her two daughters in POAs, and that would be Lee Rupplinger raised Becky and Amy in the POAs in the 70s and the 80s, and then Amy uh, in turn raised her daughter, Sammy, in the POAs up in Minnesota. Then Sammy moved down to Iowa to start training and showing some horses, and now she's got her own place, uh, Bruns Performance Horses. She's doing a great job. She's got quite a few clients from California and Wisconsin, and I'm sure Iowa. Here she is with the girl next door who did well this year with, uh, for the Seahafer Performance Horses Program in Wisconsin. This is an impulsive kid daughter. Uh, Sammy took this mare and just wiped him out this year in the two-year-olds. As you can see, all those Futurity uh, little cards there in that check. And then, of course, Speechless is another good POA. I believe Sammy owns that one. She's done a great job with that uh, horse. She's loaned her out, I believe, to people too. And uh, like I say, Sammy is, uh, is doing a fine job. She grew up in POAs. And I love this picture here. I don't think she knew I was going to do this, but she's the POA whisperer. Look at her whispering in the ear of Putt and Pretty, who had a great yearling year led by many people, but Sammy was one of them that helped guide this mare uh, to what she's doing this year and some really good placings at the International and uh, all over showing in the Midwest. Uh, Eva Dahl's watching, Elizabeth Rowe, hello guys, welcome to the podcast. We're halfway in the show tonight of episode 44, which is the Hardship Clause. We've talked about some Appaloosas and a few uh, little ponies that were hard shipped into POAs. Right now we're talking about tonight's sponsor, which is Bruns Performance Horses. I think her book's probably going to be pretty full over the next few years. So if you need, she's really good with young ones. Of course, she can train anything. Uh, but if you have something you need some touch on or somebody to take something down the road in the trailer and put some points on it, uh, Sammy Bruns is your trainer. Uh, contact her. She's on Facebook. You find her in uh, POA listings and stuff. Look her up, give her a call, and she'll do a good job for you. Bruns Performance Horses, Joyce, Iowa. And don't forget Stetson. He's going to be your assistant. All right, let's move on. And we're going to start the second half of the show with one of the better names ever in POAs. That's what hardship allows you to do, too. You can just name them anything. And this is Buddy Love. Buddy Love was a grade gilding that was hardshipped as a POA. 
Uh, Courtney wrote this. Of course, this is Courtney here. She's a trainer in Wisconsin, grew up in POAs, CEO of Performance Horses. And uh, she sent this to me. She said, Buddy Love, not a Supreme Champion or International or Congress Champion, but he got my family started in POA over 20 years ago. We were attending the county fair, and Elaine Honor approached us asking if Buddy was a POA. She got the ball rolling. I started talk, taking lessons from Elaine. She introduced us to Judy Katzenberger, who helped us hardship Buddy, and Ginger Hoke got us hooked up with the membership with the Wisconsin POA. I showed Buddy as a youth, and he later became a lesson pony in my program. Let's show some more pictures here. A buddy. Uh-oh, Green Bay hat warning. That's fine. We'll put up with it because it's buddy love. Uh, getting out of the trailer there. Looks like he's got somebody happy. I'm sure if you showed the last 20 years, you remember buddy love. Here he is as a Dalmatian. There's a basket full of puppies on his withers there and that's of course Corilla Deville so I'm going to finish what she wrote here because I got the picture up that's going to go with it now um, interesting note Buddy was the first pony that Levi Trezbatowski rode by himself no lead line now Levi was the top youth in the nation well you all remember I call him Levi T because I have a hard time pronouncing their great last name but he was our special guest along with Tommy Tomlin and our I think it was our first episode of the year this year Levi is a cool dude so is his sister and his mom and dad they're up in Wisconsin as well and uh, he's on riding getting national titles competing with everybody in POA and here he was with Buddy Love as a real little guy uh, in an arena there in Wisconsin so Buddy loves one of those ponies again that, you know, he was probably bred to be a POA and he lost his way. As you can tell, he looks like a POA. His shape and size, color, especially height. And he got saved and became the love of a lot of people's lives. Like she said, Courtney said, not a supreme champion, may never be in the Hall of Fame, but a great hardship POA. All right, the next POA we're going to talk about is the same way. This POA ended up having an award named after him because the family sponsored it. And uh, Crystal Leslie sent me a two-page really cool essay that would probably win a contest. I'm not going to be able to read all this, but I'll pick and choose uh, what I can read out of this. Thank you, uh, Crystal, for sending this. Of course, Crystal grew up, Crystal Poseybutt, up in Rhode Island. And now she lives uh, Tennessee, Kentucky border there. I believe she's a school teacher. Her and her sister grew up in POAs. Uh, and anyway, this is Crystal's Dakota, named after Crystal. And this was a unique dude for sure. I wasn't inspecting when he became a POA, but I remember when, he, when it happened. And I thought he had a very unusual pattern and marking. It's a blanket with spots but you don't really see any halos or it's just white, white and that black. And then his neck shaped kind of different and his leg action was a little different. So who knows how this guy was bred, but he looks like a POA. He's in size of a POA in color and he became a well-known one. And uh, her story here is pretty amazing. I wish I could uh, read it all in full, but I'll, I'll read some of it. She starts out, my dad purchased Dakota in October of 1993 from a horse trader in Knoxville, Tennessee. At the time, we were living in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. We had purchased, he was purchased with a severe case of white line disease and had a pretty significant hoof resection done. We were told that he had been bought specifically for a wall tapestry because of the vi vibrant color. That's kind of sad, but probably true. He was done, let's see. He was slaughter bound if my dad didn't buy him. So that's pretty cool. He saved him, that's Ben. Ben Posebutt saved this horse. He, would, he wasn't a registered anything at the time. He was gonna probably head up to Canada and have a bad ending. And she wrote a month later, we drove from Rhode Island to Knoxville 
in the front seat of a single cab flatbed F-350 pickup truck with a handmade with handmade cattle panels. So it was Thanksgiving, she says. I read this a little bit before, and he became her Christmas present. Crystal's Dakota later named that, became Crystal's uh, Christmas present. She said she became the stereotypical barn rat and was always hanging out in the barn. Uh, he was very, very green broke when they bought him, she says, and he ended up uh, kind of a runaway and some bad deals at first, but she just stuck with it. The family didn't give up on POAs. They became very big supporters of POAs, by the way, uh, Ben and Penny both, and their kids. And um, anyway, she ended up getting a handle on this POA with some guidance, getting him broke right, showing him. She became a good enough equestrian as a teenager to realize that he wasn't, he didn't have the gait and the fluid movement to compete with the big national POAs like in Western Pleasure, Pleasure classes and stuff. But he was a good start. He was shown in uh, 4-H. Our first show was 4-H, and we were asked to leave because he was so unruly, she said. Well, they came a long way from that. So, And then I believe her sister rode, rode him. Our first POA show was in 1995. Six weeks old at the time. Yep, Elizabeth is her sister. So anyway, Crystal's Dakota. I know a lot of people remember him. See that pattern back there? It was just so striking, and his color was so dark. Look at that. From a runaway and getting uh, rejected at a 4-H show to jumping and looking pretty good doing it. So this is when he was older, of course. He lived a good life, Crystal's Dakota. Again, like I say, she wrote me a small printed, I can hold it up here, two-page story about him with lots of information. Uh, and she went on to, to ride other POAs, of course, and she's still breeding POAs. She owns quite a few horses. She raises Appaloosas and POAs uh, down there. And I do want to read this part of her story because this is really cool. Uh, my junior prom was held on an Ocean Bay dinner charter boat. My dad met me in the parking lot as the boat docked, and I got in the bus, I'll tell you that story in a minute, with all my prom attire, Dakota in the trailer, and drove all night to get to Pennsylvania for a horse show the next day. I signed up for the classes with my hair and makeup still half done. So she mentioned earlier how they had the flatbed single cab Ford, and they turned that into, Ben did, into something people ended up calling the Posey Bus, and that was a bus that they converted basically into a camper. So that's a pretty cool story. So every year we got better and better. Every year we upgraded our rig. When we decided to run for national standings, and the Richland Farms Traveling Trophy, full circle back to Richland's and Dr. John Enburn. Uh, my dad bought the white bluebird bus that was used for a mobile commuter lab. Okay, computer, yeah, commuter lab. We built the Posey bus out of it. Uh, that took us from Maine to Florida and out to Oklahoma. It was our home away from home for many, many years. So that's a cool story. Again, I want to thank uh, Crystal for writing that and shedding the light a little more on Crystal's Dakota. His name is still in the rule book, the POAC handbook, about the award in his name. Here he is, a cool snow shot, and then we showed some other pictures of him here. That was on the cover. In fact, all three of these pictures were on the cover at the same time. So Crystal's Dakota... Judged him and Crystal several times, and she did it all with him. That's right. That's Denny Brown from Indiana saying that. Elizabeth's on here. I just mentioned you. Uh, he won my first international title in open jumping eight and under. So that's Elizabeth Rowe. That's Crystal's uh, sister. Lisa Reckon said, I never saw Dakota in person, but from his pictures, I always thought he looked like he had Morgan blood. He could have. He could have had some Morgan blood in him very well. And I think he might have had some different kind of Appaloosa in him too than just the normal, uh, what we come to know as the APHC, you know, in the Moscow, Idaho, 
Apple to say he could have been something completely different. But history is history. He made his mark on POA, and that's why he's getting mentioned all these years later in the Hardship Clause episode. All right, we're moving on to Blackie here. And this is, he's an awesome Blackie. So this is about, let's see, the 12th POA we're talking about tonight. Charlene Aston sent me some information on him. Uh, this is what she said. We first saw Black, Blackie at the International in Lake St. Louis. Donna Petroni owned him, and her son was showing him an eight and under. I idled up to her and told her if she ever sold him, please contact me. A couple of years passed, and we purchased a pony for Heather that was just too old, and it took a stick to make him move. The original owner purchased him back. Heather was praying for a black pony, strange enough. I looked on Dream Horse one evening, and Blackie popped up. Of course, Heather is Charlene's uh, granddaughter, Alyssa's daughter, who grew up in POAs as well. Uh, his price was a bit steep, but I called anyway. Through a lot of haggling and Donna checking us out with POA people in our area, we made the arrangements to meet in Virginia and pick him up. That was an exciting trip for Heather and for Alyssa and I. Heather and Blackie won their first Congress class the following Congress. And this dude's been the high point eight and under many years at Congress. I lost track. Uh, unfortunately, I don't keep track of the hardships when I do my leading breeders and sires, so I memorize these names. So when I see a name like him, or there's been a lot of other names over the years that's won a lot, especially in games, I just skip over it. So sometimes I forget how much they really have won and the impact they've made. Here's a cool picture right there, sharing the feed bucket together. So when Heather outgrown Blackie, she handed him down to her little sister, Charlie. Blackie has taught her how to ride, and he remains the farm favorite. He's 31 now, and I have no idea how many times he has won the High Point Small Gilding Stakes at Congress. All I can say is it's multiple times. That's Charlene. Hopefully Charlene's watching tonight. So, oh, I think she had an event. Uh, Donna Zimmerman had an event tonight. One of her mares is coming up here towards the end of the show. A lot of people, I realize there's so much stuff going on. Some people are still working. Some people are doing different things and different sporting events. There's soccer tonight and all kinds of stuff. So, uh, but thank you for everybody for sending me stuff. And you can always watch the show uh, forever on Facebook. So there's Blackie. He's kind of a genetic wonder, too, because, you know, he gets that look going. He likes people sitting the wrong way on him. I think he enjoys that a lot. And he likes double, too. So another POA that wouldn't have been a POA without the hardship. So you got a good case there for the, the pony hardship rule. All right, swinging back to more of an Appaloosa side of the hardship. This is a young Dave Morris with his young POA stallion, 2D's Co-Rebel. And like I said, we are going to have the 2D's episode. I believe it's the first or something like that in November. It's coming up in November. Dave's going to be a live guest via phone. Possibly we can get a... Uh, a hook up with a video but we can do a phone so this was a good looking stallion you can tell again his neck wasn't as long as some of the other purebred horses but you still can see his horse look because this was in what the late 70s early 80s and uh, i'm not going to talk about the two uh, morris hardship poas that are in this episode a whole lot tonight because i don't want to spoil it for november because we'll talk about them in depth and have a lot more pictures to show Dave's just down the road here in Edmond. Of course, he started out him and Bonnie in Minnesota, and then moved to Oklahoma. And uh, this was one of their stallions. And uh, he's got a great pedigree. An own son of Kaleida. Of course, Kaleida was the mystery Appaloosa. A lot of people didn't know who his uh, sire was. Some people say they did, but he became the 1963 national champion, Kaleida. And then he bred an Appaloosa mare that's 
an own granddaughter, Skipper W., and out come the small little stallion 2D's Co Rebel. Now, keep in mind, this dude's under 50, he's 54 or under. So, when he was registered and hard shipped, it wasn't 14 hands yet, and he's pure horse. There's been quite a few Appaloosas like that, like Miss Margaret, who we're not going to talk about tonight because she was in uh, the Victor. Uh, episode and there's been others that actually were short enough in the 54 inch days uh, to be considered a POA. What we will say about 2D's Co Rebel is that he did become a premier sire. He's in the Hall of Fame. I think five of the POAs we're talking about tonight ended up in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Tom showed him. There's Tommy Morris right there. That's later in the Stallion's life. That's of course the 1990 International Show in Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, he ended up siring 2D's Co. Rusty, a Supreme Champion, and in the Hall of Fame, 2D's Co. Bell, Supreme Champion, Tia's Rebel Dandy, another Supreme, 2D's Co. Bar, 2D's Co. Brandy, and 2D's Co. Barrette uh, were all by him, and then were all ROM, either in Halter or Timed, those last three I mentioned. So, again, we'll talk about him further, uh, but you can see his stature and stuff that he was was a horse and a pretty well-bred horse uh, kind of ahead of his time as well. So another hardship POA that helped the Morris is a great deal in their program. And Susie, Rich, Chris, and Tom all showed this mare. This is the Bar K Daisy Bar. And Daisy is a proven producer, has her ROM and non-time, and has her Premier Dam Award, and she is also in the Hall of Fame. So she ended up being the mother of Quite a few 2Ds that we'll be showing next month. 2Ds Skipper Babe, Supreme Champion and Hall of Famer. 2Ds Co Rusty, Supreme Champion Hall of Fame. 2Ds Co Bar, Bar K Pebbles, and 2Ds Co Barrette. So those two that we just showed uh, were crossed many times, and Dave will be talking about that when he's our guest uh, in a future episode. So stay tuned for that. That'll be cool. Let's see. What about 2D Skipper Babe? Yeah, 2D Skipper Babe I just mentioned. So you beat me to it, uh, Kenley. I just mentioned 2D Skipper Babe, of course, Supreme Champion and Hall of Fame. She wasn't by the Stallion Co. Rebel, but she was out of this mare. This is her mother, the Bar K Daisy Bar. Of course, she was sired by Salty Skipper Britches uh, that Dave lost and basically replaced him with Co. Rebel. So thanks for that comment. We have a lot of comments tonight, a lot of people watching. I enjoy that. Thank you for watching the live show. We're moving on to another hardship POA, and this is KSA Pretty Poppy. And KSA Pretty Poppy was owned by the Dugard family of South Dakota. I remember uh, Stacy showing this uh, mare in the 80s when we first got in it. This was her riding POA and then she replaced it with Doc Sugar Babe. Uh, they purchased her in 83 and she became her junior pony and then all around like in 86 or so still as a junior pony. Uh, but Kay, Stacy's mom, was nice enough to send me some stuff on KSA Pretty Poppy whose registration number was 25324. Uh, became a POA ROM non-time and a POA uh, or an ROM timed and ROM champion. So uh, she was hardship by Kay and Stacy Dugard, who is now Stacy Dugard Lynch. For those of you uh, remembering Stacy back in the 80s, uh, KSA Pretty Poppy was hardshipped by the Dugards from South Dakota in 1980. She was a 52 inch age mare at that time and was purchased from a family in Sioux Falls. The Dugards were told that Poppy came from a sale barn in Sioux City, so quite likely had a pedigree that was lost. Well, Sioux City is in Iowa, of course, and Iowa is a hotbed for POAs, so it's very likely that she was uh, a POA. She could, I could think of several programs that she might have came from, but it'd just be speculation. I wish I had the time and resources to investigate some of these old POAs and uh, if we would have known then what we know now about DNA and stuff, we could have tracked some of these down. It'd be pretty cool to find out where some of them come from. So her hardship inspection was done by Leonard Lewis. And 
This started a long friendship between the Lewis and Dugard families. Poppy quickly earned her ROM non-timed, ROM timed, and POA ROM champion and had enough halter points for a supreme champion but couldn't garner the required number of grands and reserves competing in the tough South Dakota-Minnesota halter circuit. Well, that's true because if she was purchased in or hardshipped in 80, she would have showed in the early 80s, and you had Black Swan S, Double Deck, all kinds of them back then. So Sandy Tough Dots. Uh, just C.A. Zammer, Red, right, I'm uh, missing some famous ones too. But all kind, and then Wisconsin and Iowa people coming to Minnesota and South Dakota shows. Of course, the Santee marriage starting to pop up in the 80s. So yeah, competition was was stiff back then in halter. Uh, let's see, she and Stacy earned numerous high point awards in South Dakota and com- competed in South Dakota, Minnesota, Nebraska, and Iowa. In 1984, she and Stacy won trail 9 through 12 at the Midwest Regional, and in 1986, they won senior reigning at the Midwest Regional. Poppy was also a force to be reckoned with in the open show and 4-H arenas. In addition to carrying Stacy to several 4-H Grand and Reserve Championships, in 1986, they were state 4-H champions in senior reigning against all the good reigning court horses in South Dakota. Let's see if we got another picture here. Here we go. 52-inch mare. Doc Sugar Babe was purchased as Stacy's junior pony in 1983. She was a yearling at the time. And she continued to show Poppy as well. Stacy left for college in the fall of 1989. Kay was transferred to Minneapolis, and Poppy was sold to Teresa Rich, also of South Dakota. She taught Teresa the ins and outs of the horse show world and lived the good life with the riches in her final years. Poppy suffered from Cushing's disease, but still lived to the ripe old age of 31. So again, a a pony that might have lost its way and ended up a great mount and a cool story uh, in POAs, uh, thanks to the hardship clause. Okay, here we got another little pony that became a hardship. This is Charlie Bear. I should know a lot about Charlie Bear, but I don't because, again, uh, I've had a blind spot to hardships. I didn't always pay attention to them, uh, but they play an important part in POAs. This is young... uh, Oh, I'm drawing a blank here. Brent. Brent Reed. I should know that. I played catch with him in arena before. So Brent won the 9 and under equitation high point in the nation with this... uh, this mare, Charlie Bear, and uh, as Brent's mom said, Lori, not many boys' names on that trophy. She was definitely one in a million. And she did have a cool look about her. Uh, she didn't really have that real old pony look. She just was, I'm sure this one was definitely uh, bred to be a POA and just lost her way. Uh, but she did well for for the Reeds in Iowa. She said, uh, Lori said she was a spitfire back in her younger days. She was shown at local shows around Northwest Iowa and then sold to a family who hard shipped her. And then we purchased her after Brent's pony suddenly died. Brent and Charlie Bear made quite a team. Brent was four riding and walk trot lope classes. They had quite a successful show career in eight and under. She is buried in my parents' pasture which, of course, would be the Copsel family, who also showed POAs, uh, too. So, cool story there about Charlie Bear up in uh, Iowa, so northern Iowa. So, I remember watching Brent show her. We were in POAs then, of course. So, uh, this picture here, I like this picture, the two socks in the back, and he looks so tiny on that. I'm sure he's enjoying that if he's watching. He just joined... The POA history page yesterday or today group. So welcome, Brent. Hopefully you're enjoying this episode if you're watching it. All right, so we move on to PPP's Mickey Gilly. Of course, PPP standard for, stood for Porter POA Ponies, I believe is what it stood for. Uh, and Mickey Gilly was one of those that Tracy found. I believe she hardshipped this one. And he was on the cover. Of course, there's a young Tara 
and PPP's Mickey Gilly on the cover. Uh, the annual stallion edition, but a gilding was on the cover. I always thought that was uh, funny, but it's okay. Jeff Kirkbride, I apologize for the photo here off this cover. It probably moved to five or six different houses and has been beat up a little bit. And then this is just a snapshot from my phone, but this is a professional photo that was beautiful in the day by Jeff Kirkbride Photography. And Tara's looking cool there in her blue and smiling. She's happy to be holding that pony. And there they are. I wish this was in color, but that's fine. This is Beauty and the Beast because Tara's outfit was really cool in this picture. Of course, he's the beast and she's the beauty. And uh, that was a cool costume idea. So this, of course, got uh, Tara's family really into POAs. Her mother, Cindy, became the first official president of the board of directors and POAs. Tara went on to show uh, I'm a Silverado from the Damon family who uh, they did a lot of things together. And Tara's sister, I might screw this up, I think her name's Ashley. Hopefully I didn't screw that up. She showed some good POAs as well. And uh, they had a long show career from Oklahoma. And this little guy, well, he wasn't that little, but this hardship POA, PPP's Mickey Gilly, really got him going. So if you ever pull up the magazine, it's from February 1994. There's a really nice article written by Tara. She's young in 1994, very young, but she wrote this article about her pony and how she got into POAs and how he helped her through just basically trials and tribulations. And uh, she mentions Cody Porter in here and of course uh, Tracy and, and of course Tara's family. So this is PPP's Mickey Gilly. All right. The last POA we're going to talk about tonight in depth is the Appaloosa mare that was hardship. This is Gunnerette. So, of course, Gunnerette was owned by the Zimmerman family from Florida. Now they've relocated near me over here. They live in, in between Jet and Cherokee, Oklahoma. Got a beautiful program going over there with a nice young corridor stallion and some POA mares. I think one or two of this mare's daughters, I know one for sure, is there. And uh, they're raising some nice babies. Aaron Metcalf, of course, is Donna's uh, daughter. And then uh, I think Rick, right, is her son in Florida. And uh, this mare had a lot of POAs, and she won at the national show. This is Marin Foal here in 2010. She threw a lot of yellow foals. I think she only produced two red foals in her life. She's still alive. This mare's still going. She's got some age on her now, and she's got a knee. Um, that's bothering her, at least one knee, but uh, this is what uh, Donna wrote about Gunnerette. She said, I sold her to Catherine Kennard in Florida because the Oklahoma winters were really bothering her knees. She got two fillies out of her and gave her to Emily Beatty, who sold her to a lady in New York. She's just writing all this stuff to me, but I believe Kenley Afton has her now, and you're watching live, Kenley. So, yay, my girl, I've been waiting for her. Yeah, I made her last, so you uh, you had to wait. So I didn't know if you were tuned in or not. No, that's just how it fell. She fell number 18 out of 18 in here. So, And I did have, like, 20 pictures, but I, I couldn't have that many pictures tonight. So I actually went to Donna's house, and she came here to the dealership since she's so close, and she used to work out of Enid, and I – was able to take a whole bunch of pictures. You can see the glass reflection on some of these uh, because they were still in the frames. But of course they use rhythm in a lot of the names. So, you know, she had rhythm in the blues, uh, ex exclusive rhythm, envy my rhythm, rhythm and gold. Oh, uh, there's quite a few others too. I know the Denny's ended up with, uh, I think at least two gildings up in Kansas, the Denny family, famous POA family that still in POAs. This is a cool shot here. This was five of her babies. Uh, that's pretty cool to, at a POA event to have five foals out of one mare. So, and I know uh, Vardarello's from Michigan. That's them in the pic, the two of them in the picture there. They had uh, Betty and Heather. They had a couple, I believe, at least one. The one in the middle, I know, is Betty. So, uh, Donna couldn't be on tonight because she's at Stetson something football game. I believe I don't think it's soccer. I think it's football this time of year So she couldn't be live, but 
Anyway, here's that glass reflection I'm talking about, but a nice Shane Rux photo, professional photo at the 14 Congress. There's another one of them, of her foals. You can see that horsey look in the neck. Gunner up. I'll read her pedigree to you. She's a 2002 mare, according to All Breed Data Base, and her sire was Exclusive Gunner, an Appaloosa Stallion by Bright Joker Eyes, who's a prince, Prince's Jim double grandson, meaning Prince's Jim is his grandsire top and bottom. The bottom side uh, goes back to Waddy Cash and then Bar Heels on the bottom side. So the mother to Gunnerette was a quarter horse. And like I say, they use rhythm in the name. A lot of their foals, Irresistible Rhythm. The Denny's own him now. He's a, let's see, and then the Leopard, I think, right here is Exclusive Rhythm. I think I have that right. Guns and Diamonds was by RY Diamond Equity. Let's see, Exclusive Rhythm. Yeah, that's, I've said that one before. Envy My Rhythm. That's the baby that I showed. I believe this is Envy My Rhythm right there. One at the International in 2010. And then the five full siblings, I believe they're all by Bobo, Sot, and Dotton, uh, are, let's go back to that, Exclusive Rhythm, Rhythm and Blues, Envy My Rhythm, Rhythm and Gold, and Irresistible Rhythm. There, Donna, I hope I got that all in for you. So, and then here's a couple of those. There's one of her red foals. She didn't have many red foals. Most of them were were Palomino. So, so if you're watching tonight and you're sitting there going, well, where was my hardship? I apologize. Like I said before, you guys could take a guess, but an educated, estimated historian guess would be probably three to 5,000 hardships over the years out of 50,000 some, almost 60,000 registered POAs. There's been a lot of them. Some of them were horses like we talked about uh tonight some were registered appaloosas some were bred to be registered appaloosas but were never registered and then just became poas and then of course you have the buddy love he's a awesome blackie uh types like that al capone uh, melvin the th ones that were just ponies spotted ponies that maybe were bred to be poas maybe they were like black ham we gotta remember that's how this breed started uh, a pony stallion. They say Shetland, and some reports say he was just a pony stallion, but a little stallion bred a, an Appaloosa Arabian cross mare, and that's how uh, a spotted pony started. So that became the Pony of the Americas. So, again, you know, there's some other famous hardships like Lotta Rockin', KS's JW White Lighting, Miss Margaret, Prince Plaudit Jr., Salty Godelux in the Hall of Fame, Prince Fury, Gold Prince. I had reasons why I didn't put all those on here. Nothing against the horses, just they've either been talked about in other episodes or some of them are going to be talked about in the future. And there's other ones I probably missed, but I couldn't have uh, 50 POAs on here tonight. I don't know what time it is. It's 8 o'clock. We had a little, a few goofs at the beginning of the show, but I'm glad you stuck with us. And um, Kenley, I hope I did all right by your old mare there. You still have her. She says, I have her last daughter. She's a yearling Palomino snowcap. So, yeah, that mare uh, threw c color pretty well. And, of course, she carried that Palomino. And uh, Ashley's watching tonight. Charlie Phillips, Pam, uh, all kinds of people. I'm glad everybody's watching and enjoying the show. Uh, the upcoming shows, let's see where that list is. Probably buried back here. I think I talked about it a little bit. Yeah, I hit on that. So, that's fine. The Doc Nemers episode, one of my closest friends in POAs. I haven't talked to Doc for a few years now, but when I was active, uh, we talked all the time. I always seen him at, at the events, of course. I conditioned a few horses for him over the years, and uh, he's going to be the episode, his program, talk about his family, how they got into breeding POAs, and then hit as many of the POAs as we can that they bred. You know, a lot of people don't realize this, but Doc bred for a lot of great POAs, that didn't carry his prefix because he sold a lot of mares. He was always shuffling his mares forever in his career, uh, trying to better his program. So even like Perpetually Tipped is one that we've talked about that he's the breeder, so in POAs like that. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, 
in two weeks. Next week will be dark because I need two weeks to prepare for the docs uh, episode. Again, we have sponsorships available. Uh, thank you to Bruns Performance Horses for being the sponsor this week. They're also going to be a sponsor uh, in two weeks from now. Also, see Hay for Performance Horses as a sponsor two weeks from now. I have the $20 sponsorships. I limit five per episode, so we just ain't talking uh, like the rest of the story. Paul Harvey and I'm just advertising Husqvarna's and pitching stuff. I, I need some sponsorships because this thing takes away from my uh, time as, at my career. Uh, but it's doing good. You guys are helping me out, and I want to keep bringing this to you. I'm also trying to become a judge. So I just uh, applied for a POA card. Hopefully that goes a lot better than it did 10 years ago. Had some hiccups there. I'm going to the CBC in January and February, the four-day uh, Color Breed Congress uh, seminar. So that'll be cool, my first time to go. I've known about that thing since I was a teenager, and I'm finally going to go at 50 years old. So I'm going to start another career here as a horse judge, and hopefully I get some cards. Uh, when I start getting busy doing that, we'll see how often I can do these POA podcasts. So enjoy them while we're doing them. I sure uh, like the feedback and everything. So, all right, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this uh, show. We made it, uh, you know, a couple hours almost. So uh, we talked about some great POAs. Hopefully you learned some stuff and uh, hopefully it brought up some good memories and I did justice to all the hardship POAs we talked about. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you in two weeks.